The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you can hear us very clearly. Uh, for those who already have seen the question box in the panel tool list on the right hand side, if you can please type in yes, you can hear us. This would be of, uh, of great help for us. Oh, let's see. Yes, thank you so much. And sound check for Scott. Can you say something, Scott? Yeah, and I hope that my microphone is working too. So can you hear Scott also? Yes, many yes. Thank you so oh, much. Great. Perfect. Uh, we will wait a couple of minutes because we see that many, many of you are still dialing in. So give us a few more minutes and then we'll kick this uh, WebEx or webinar off. And just for you to know, many of you ask, you will get the recording, you will get the materials. So no worries at all. Uh, you will get them after this session. Yes, there will be visuals and you, you should already see them. So you will not see our faces, you will see the screen. Um, the number for the UK, in order to find the number, you need to go to phone call and then you will have the different numbers there. You see it in the panel, all the different numbers. It's normal that you can see the other questions that people are writing. Only uh, Scott and I, as the presenters, can see the questions. But we'll answer them then for everyone at the end of the session. All our participants are on mute as the question is coming. We will start in a few minutes. We still see a lot of people dialing in and then you should be able to hear us. One more minute and then we'll kick it off. So it's five past one, we are starting. Um, just as I get many, many different questions already right now concerning recordings. Yes, you will get the recordings. Uh, and the second thing is that some uh, of you 
uh, are not getting in, and these are mainly uh, because we are already full and all the short-term uh, registrations cannot be accepted anymore. I'm sorry for this, but we'll share the recordings with you afterwards. So I hope that all the others can really hear us clearly. Um, okay, then. With that said, let's start. Welcome, everyone, to our webinar, uh, Understanding the Novel Coronavirus. And what's the purpose of today? Our goals are that we share our expertise with the novel coronavirus, uh, that we give your guidance on how to keep your employees and your customers safe. And we also want to give you some practical insights uh, to really help combat the coronavirus in all the different segments. My name is Victoria Wagner. You can see me on the left hand side. I'm leading the training and technical service team of Institutional Europe. Uh, I'm now more than 10 years within the industry. Uh, and I'm a food chemist. And I have my wonderful, charming colleague, Scott Killeen, with me. Scott, hand it over to you. Yeah, hi. Um, my name is Scott Killeen. Um, I'm a chemist. Um, I've been working in the area of cleaning products and disinfectants for about 18 years now. And I'm responsible for all the technical work and research and development done for our quick service restaurants and food retail services divisions in Europe. Great. So let me start. What do we know about the coronavirus? Uh, what we know so far is that we have a pandemic. It's caused by SARS-CoV-2, which was till then an unknown virus. It has been identified end of 2019, and that's why the disease is called COVID-19. Uh, the WHO, the World Health Organization, declared a uh, public health emergency. Uh, and in general, we always recommend to stay up to date, to really get the information from the World Health Organization, the German RKI, or the local health authority. These are really some of the uh, sources that we'd like to recommend to you. And in addition, we have an overview of sources at the end of this presentation. Uh, what I forgot to mention, you will see that the slides are packed very full. That's done on purpose because we want to give you all the different information. You will get the slides afterwards anyhow. Uh, so they can read through it clearly. Um, what is a coronavirus? A coronavirus is a large family of viruses, and uh, they are normally known because of the common cold. And I think many of you know these different colds that you usually have in winter. Uh, but there are some famous uh, coronaviruses. One is the MERS, and the other is the SARS-CoV-1 virus. Uh, they occurred in 2002 and 2012. Uh, and at these times, there were epidemics and not uh, pandemics. And now we have the SARS-CoV-2 that was identified end of 2019. And SARS means severe acute respiratory syndrome, already uh, telling us what the syndrome is of this disease. Uh, why is it important and what else do we need to know? We need to understand that infected persons may show no symptoms for up to 14 days. This can happen. It can happen that you have no symptoms at all, but nevertheless, you can transmit the disease. And at the moment, there are still no specific treatments or vaccines available. It's most dangerous for people over 65 and people with pre-existing conditions. And so far, the symptoms uh, that we know are respiratory sy symptoms, fever, cough, shortness of breath, and trouble breathing. In addition, the latest study have shown uh, that uh, it can happen that patients have also a loss of taste or smell in addition to the normal symptoms. How does coronavirus spread? And it's really linked to most of the coronavirus, but especially to COVID-19. We know that they are spreading by air, by close personal contact, and by touching a surface that is contaminated with the virus, and then touching our mouth. And then we can, the virus can enter with the eyes, nose, and mouse into the body. So uh, the latest uh, studies have shown that mainly air and close contact is uh, the transmission way of this virus and that can lead to COVID-19. And that's why we have all these different uh, yeah, new regulations in place in different countries, because this is seen as one of the most uh, famous transports these days. We get many, many questions on the survival time of surfaces. Um, what we know so far, we know we have a virus and not a bacteria. This means there is now no multiplication possible 
outside any kind of host. So on services, it will not, uh, there will be no multiplication of the virus. We also know that the survival time uh, is between four, 24 hours and nine days. Uh, RKI says approximately six days, and the latest studies show that it really depends uh, on the surface. So latest studies say copper is around four hours, uh, papers 24 hours, stainless steel up to uh, 48 hours, and plastic 72 hours. And within aerosols, it's up to three hours. And that's important to understand because this will lead us later to the different measures we need to take in terms of hygiene. And that's why it's interesting to know the survival times. Um, the survival time, in addition, is uh, depending on the temperature, the humidity, and the surface condition. Uh, and we also know that drying out and UV rays uh, promote the dying, uh, and low temperature and high humidity uh, favors the survival time. Scott, anything that I've forgotten that you'd like to add at this time? No, I think I think you've you've covered you've covered most of, of what's needed. Um, really, I think that the most critical thing here is to remember that the multiplication doesn't happen on surfaces. Multiplication of the virus will only happen inside the body. So it is different from dealing with bacteria, which is what people would normally be aware of when we talk about hygiene and disinfectants. So this, this puts us in, a, in a, a much better situation, actually makes it easier for us to deal with it. Thank you. Um, we now will show you and guide us to different recommendations depending on the different segments you're working in, and we will try to cover everything, uh, as we'll see in a minute. Uh, and that's where I hand over to Scott. Yeah, thanks. So um, this is a, a, a global pandemic. So there's a lot of recommendations from local health authorities around the world. They, each country is dealing with things sorry, slightly differently, but the general principles are going to be the same. So personal hygiene is really one of the biggest things we have to pay attention to. So this is, when we talk about this in particular, we're looking at hand hygiene and how we're coughing, so preventing the spread of, of any droplets through aerosols through the air. Um, then we can go through to what materials are needed to, to do this. So do we need to have um, some sort of a face mask or do we have to have access to hand disinfectants or surface disinfectants? And this is really the, the critical thing. Once we've looked after that, we can take care of a lot. On top of this, then we have to monitor, okay, how are we actually working in our businesses? So what's happening with our employees? Are they healthy? Are we paying attention to what's happening with them? Do we have to um, single out people and say, okay, this person has had contact with somebody. Do they have to start working from home? Um, do we have to separate them from other people? So figuring out the, the people aspect of things and how we manage the procedures then to stop a spread of the virus within our business so we can keep our businesses running as functionally as possible. And of course, from a business management point of view, how do we take care of people's skin? If we're telling people to be washing and disinfecting their hands the whole time, this is also going to put stress on skin. So we need to give the full range of support to our workers from keeping them clean and, and hygienic through to having good health at the end of the day. Yeah, in terms of the risk profiles, we have identified three different risk profiles. We have green, yellow, and red. Green means there is no outbreak known in any area. Risk means, uh, yellow means that there is already an epidemic ongoing. Uh, and uh, in the red area, it means we already have the pandemic. I will not go in detail through all the different things, but important to know is that in the green risk profile, you just have your uh, normal procedures that you anyhow have designed per site. In yellow, this means that you really need to yeah, have special uh, procedures in place to reinforce training and hygiene and create uh, more awareness around this topic. And within red, we are already in the pandemic, and this means we need to do everything to break the infection chain. How to protect yourself? Yeah, so protecting ourselves is actually very straightforward. Um, okay, at the moment, we don't have a vaccine. We don't have clear ways of, of treating the virus if we do get infected, but preventing it happening, we can do an awful lot in our day-to-day -day lives to really prevent us catching the, 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 the virus. Remember how the virus gets into the body. It comes in into, through droplets in, um, into your throat and starts to multiply there. 
So the way to do it is preventing the virus getting into your body. You do this by washing your hands as often as possible and doing it correctly. Now, washing your hands correctly is, is a really a critical thing. We talk about you need to wash your hands for 20 seconds. Now, this doesn't mean the whole process is taking 20 seconds. This means actually rubbing the wet soap into your hands. You should be doing this for 20 seconds. You need this full process to actually remove enough of the, the virus particles from your hand. Um, and then, of course, you need to rinse as well under running water to, to wash them away. Um, touching your eyes, nose and mouth is something people do subconsciously and an awful lot. And this is the, the real risk of getting it into your body. So this is why we say keep washing your hands. If you have anything on your hands, you'd be surprised how often you are touching your face. And then you're just bringing the virus closer and closer to a part of your body where it can, where it can multiply and replicate. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. I think this is quite a, an obvious one. Um, avoid areas where live animals are being sold or raised. We know that this virus actually has its, origi its origins in animal base or animal derivatives of, of coronaviruses, which have jumped across the species. We should try and avoid this happening wherever possible. And wearing a mask and seeking medical advice immediately if we think we, we're showing some of the symptoms, particularly if we have a fever. And this is just generally to, to start protecting other people as well, not just ourselves. So when we talk about protecting others, um, everything we do to prevent ourselves getting sick will also help others. It'll help stop the, the spread of the virus. But there's other things we can do beyond just washing our hands and keeping things um, hygienically clean. So wearing a mask, it's been discussed in many countries. If we need to have uh, legal requirements to be wearing masks during different applications or different activities we're doing, wearing masks will reduce the risk of us passing the virus onto someone else by reducing the droplets that we're expelling when we cough. Staying home when we're sick and avoiding contact with others. If there's a risk that we have the virus, the easiest way to stop it spreading is don't have contact with other people. By doing this, you're breaking the chain. Um, <clears throat> Seeing a doctor immediately, um, there's a lot of illnesses out there which could be mistaken for the coronavirus. So a common cold will give you some of the symptoms that are the same. So it's important to find out if we feel we have something which could be um, COVID-19, get in touch with a doctor, find out for sure, and then you know exactly what, what precautions you need to be taking. And cleaning and disinfecting objects and surfaces this is also important because if we cough, if we've touched our mouths and brought the virus onto our hands, and we're touching surfaces in our house or outside of the house, we're leaving traces of the virus there. And that can, of course, lead to someone else picking it up after us. So, so uh, there are different steps you need to uh, take into account uh, for your business. Most important, and we already mentioned it, is really the health and hygiene practices and ensure that every employee complies to them. Then it's important to clean and disinfect hard surfaces and especially the high touch areas. And we'll come to this also later because there are many high touch areas you need to keep in mind. In mind uh, here only a few of them to really clean and disinfect them properly. And also cleaning has really a good effect on decreasing the amount of viruses on the surface. And of course, uh, wearing the proper PPE. And that's uh, also another section that will come later. Um, but Scott, uh, there are some good news around the uh, coronavirus. Ab absolutely. Um, we're very lucky in this situation. There are different types of vir viruses out there. There's so-called enveloped and non-enveloped viruses. And the coronavirus is an enveloped virus. And this means it's particularly easy for us to kill with chemical disinfectants. So it's no more difficult, really, compared to a normal bacteria. We shouldn't, when we talk about killing this virus, we shouldn't be thinking about procedures we've had to use in the past if we've had a norovirus outbreak or a C. diff outbreak. These sort of organisms like norovirus, C. diff, they're extremely difficult to kill. And you're going to need extremely difficult or extremely strong chemistry to actually do it. What we're seeing with, with the coronavirus is normal cleaning procedures and normal disinfection procedures are going to be enough. We don't have to go to extremely dangerous chemistries to actually start getting rid of it. And this is really you know, a big help to all of us that when you break it down to the basics, standard procedures are going to be your lifesaver in this situation. Thank you. 
So in terms of the action plan, this of course depends according to your business segment. In general, always follow the uh, local public health recommendations. Uh, then also inform all your employees about the proper infection control procedures. Reinforce the personal hand hygiene and don't forget about the hand and cuff etiquette. Also provide enough hygiene materials and uh, as said, clean and disinfect uh, surfaces and high touch objects. And in terms, uh, uh, depending on the different segments for restaurants, please continue as you already do to follow the good hygiene practice. In addition, depending, of course, on the country you're living in, a transition to the go might be uh, useful uh, and considered. For hotels, if still open, <laughs> consider really closing of non-essential public gathering areas. And uh, for external service providers, we really uh, uh, like to inform it that it makes sense to intensify the communication with your customers. This can be the hygiene lead, the housekeeping management, uh, but really have a clear view uh, and a clear communication with your customers. For care, uh, that's really important that you educate and inform all employees about the proper infection control procedures, reinforce training there, and also think about closing non-essential public areas. And also for retail, really reinforce the hygiene procedures. What about food safety? So we're in a really good situation here. When, when we talk about food safety, um, our normal food safety procedures that we're all following in day to day are actually going to help us get through this, this coronavirus crisis as well. Because the, as I mentioned, the coronavirus is, is no more difficult to kill than our standard bacteria that we're trying to kill in the kitchen. So if we follow our standard procedures, then we're going to be fine. There's no need for panic when we're talking about food safety here. The German National Institute for Risk Assessment has come out and they've done studies and they've come out and said, OK, they see the risk of transmission via food as really minimal. And so person to person remains the most critical way of, of transmission here. So if you look after your normal HACCP plan and follow the, the recommendations of that properly, you should be OK here as well. And what about shipments and incoming goods? Um, here, if we go back to what you had mentioned earlier about the studies that have been done on how long the virus survives on different surfaces, this actually gives us the key to our answer. The risk here is, is extremely low. The virus will die if it's on a surface over time. So if it's a, um, a dry surface, um, so like cardboard you mentioned, it's got a very short um, lifetime on cardboard. So if something is sent to us, from abroad, from abroad, from a region where they have a risk of uh, an outbreak, by the time that the product actually gets to us, typically it's going to take a couple of days in transit. And then when it reaches us, any virus that was there will have died or will be inactivated by that point. So we don't have much to, to, to worry about. What is important though is, you do still need to focus on your normal hygiene practice, especially the hand hygiene. You don't know where that box has been. There could be anything else on it, any other sort of germs or bacteria, any dirt that's on it. So if you're going to be handling boxes that are coming in with deliveries or shipments, make sure you wash your hands afterwards before you touch your face. This is just a general recommendation, regardless of the situation with the virus or not. And now, what we've done uh, during the last couple of days and weeks, we have collected the questions that are coming and tried to really answer them step by step. So we'll guide you through all these answers. Uh, and you will see also there, it's quite full, but uh, don't worry, we'll share the presentation later on with you. We'll go on to the most important points to make you aware about what's really important right now. So, Scott, can you really shortly summarize the hygiene measures? <laughs> yes. Um, so if, if you think somebody is infected or, or you have a confirmation that somebody is in, infected, you're going to have to first of all think about access restrictions. So how do you prevent the disease being passed on then to other people? So, you know, restrict um, people should only be working if they need to be working. Um, keeping people out of, out of situations where they would be in large contact with other people. Of course, if someone is infected, you need to get them out of your business straight away and, and, and home into isolation. Um, but you're going to have to go in then and say, OK, we've had a, a worker working here who turns out to be infected. So what, what do we do? How do we, how do we clean our restaurant? How do we clean our, our store, whatever it is, um, so people can come back in again afterwards? 
Now, training is very important. You need, to, you need to know for sure that the people who are going to go in and clean and disinfect the room afterwards, that they know what they're doing. There's no point in someone um, going in to clean it if they don't know what they're looking for. So make sure that the, 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 the training that you have for your people um, is, is up to date and people know what steps have to be followed in the normal cleaning procedures. It's important to provide PPE because you're putting someone into an environment where there is a risk, yes, we know there could be um, a high amount of the virus on the surfaces in here or in the room, whatever. So you want to make sure that they're, they're given the full protection that, they, that, that you can offer them. And this can be anything from face masks um, to prevent them inhaling any aerosols which might be formed while they're doing the cleaning, protective clothing so that they don't get something onto their clothes which will then take home with them and possibly reinfect themselves afterwards from that, and protective gloves and goggles. So um, the goggles, as we mentioned before, it is possible to absorb the virus through your eyes to get it, for it to get into your body that way as well. You want to use a suitable disinfectant. Now we said that, that um, it's not a difficult virus to kill, but nevertheless, using the right disinfectant is important. You want to be sure that you're actually going to be killing the virus as well when you're doing it. Follow your, your procedures, which have already been defined. So you should have, you should know clearly what concentrations you should be using, what application it works on, you know, what materials are you going to use to be doing the cleaning, how long does the procedure have to go on for before surfaces are, are cleaned and disinfected. And really make sure people understand this point. Hand hygiene, you know, if we're cleaning and disinfecting a, a room for a longer period of time, we still have to remember we could be picking up this, this virus on our hands as we're doing that job. So regular, regular washing of hands or, or sanitizing of hands is also important. And then we've got to consider, okay, all of the surfaces will be there that everything we've cleaned and disinfected we could, but what about the surfaces we can't clean or disinfect? So for example, textiles, how are we going to deal with them? And they're going to need different procedures compared to normal to make sure that they're safe for use afterwards. So, uh, and in terms, there has uh, there is a known case of COVID-19 in uh, one of the rooms in one of your sites, then it's really important to stick to the body protections as noted there. It's from the CDC, you see the source uh, there. Uh, and it's important to wear the body protection. These are usually disposal overalls, then a respiratory, mask, uh, I will come to this later on, which masks are helping and which are not so good. Then uh, it's recommended, as just said, to wear proper eye protection, Googles or face shields, and also the right gloves. So that's really important. In, if you have somebody that's infected and you'd like to clean the room, then please stick to these uh, special PPEs. What about gloves? Yeah, gloves are... Uh... A double-edged sword. Um, on one side they're great, but on the other side you have a risk that, that you give someone gloves and they feel like an invincible superhero, they can do what they want. Um, and that's not right. The, the basic thing when we talk about does someone need to wear gloves from a hygiene point of view, the first thing you should look at is, okay, doesn't matter what you do, in, improving your hand hygiene and, and coughing um, procedures is, is, is critical. That's the, the, the highest standard. That's the, the one you absolutely, absolutely have to hit. If you put on gloves as well, then, okay, you're getting this extra barrier between your skin and the, the virus. But you can just as easily put the, get, collect the virus on the glove, and then by touching your mouth, touching your face, you can pass it on. So your gloves are going to need to be disinfected as well. You have to make sure that if you're getting virus onto them, that you're killing it as well quite quickly. Um, and as well, wearing gloves for, for longer periods of time can also be a, um, a, a risk from a hand um, safety point of view, because inside a glove, it can be, it can be very moist. It can, in fact, you can actually encourage um, bacteria or, whatever to, or, or fungi to grow on your skin underneath the glove. So it's, they're useful, yes, when you need them. So depending on the activity you're doing, you might have to wear, you might have to wear gloves but actually washing your hands more frequently and disinfecting your hands more frequently is, is just as important as, or if not more effective than just wearing the glove. Yes, and in terms of uh, masks, there are two masks that you know quite well, and uh, we have the N95 or FFP mask, and uh, you have three 
glasses one, two, and three, and this describes a leakage rate. This means for glass one, maximum 25% leakage rate is uh, normal. For uh, glass two, it's maximum 11%, and for three, it's 5%. And uh, for COVID, you need to wear at least the FFP2 uh, glass. But keep in mind the maximum wearing time. It's up to two hours, depending on the mask, not longer. Otherwise, it's not effective anymore. And in addition, you know the surgical mask that you have on the right-hand side, and they are limited effective. I know that some of the countries already have a law in place that you need to wear them, in, uh, for example, in, when going to a supermarket, and they can be affected mainly for protecting others. They can help yourself not to get ill because they avoid touching your mouth and nose when really put on correctly. And they can also hold back secretions from sneezing or speaking. Um, and what's also important to know that the coronavirus is very large. Compared to the norovirus, it's really uh, so large that it cannot easily penetrate through this mask. However, as soon as the mask gets damp, it can easily go through. But that's important to know. If you really want to be protected uh, and especially working in an environment around care, you should wear FFP2 mask. And as we know that this mask uh, currently, uh, yeah, that we do not have enough, you need really to handle them carefully. Uh, and uh, one thing is to wear them properly. So this means uh, wash your hands thoroughly. Really have in mind that they should not be damaged and uh, ask, uh, and. Uh, have a look that they are really uh, have a proper placement. So no hairs underneath, no glasses, whatever. Otherwise, they are not effective. Normally, this kind of mask are only for single use. However, we do not have enough masks uh, all over the globe. And that's why in this emergency case, they can be reused, but only under certain uh, circumstances. This means they need to be clearly assigned to a person uh, they should not be disinfected with a chemical, and you should not touch the inner. In addition, there are also some reusable respiratory masks uh, available on the market where the basic body can be disinfected and where you can change this filtering face piece. Some links are underneath to get further information about this reusable mask. If you'd like to reuse the mask, then you need really to prevent that uh, somebody else is getting contaminated so you should really always uh, also have a proper hand hygiene in place uh, then you need to store them uh, in dry in the air just temporarily restrict in a restricted area and also really clean this restricted area area and disinfect it properly so that really nobody can get infected so and always as said before uh, yeah, have a look at the hand hygiene, that's very important. But this is only in place if you really need to reuse the mask. If not, if you have enough, please use another one. So disinfectant products, uh, we get many questions on this, especially on the uh, effect and uh, what we need to know about disinfectants. Scott, what can you tell us around these products? Yeah, so as we mentioned before, the um, the virus is, is chemically an, an easy one for us to kill. And this makes our, our, our life a lot easier when we talk about what products can we be using and working with it or working against it. So we do need to look at products that have at least a, a limited virucidal effect. This means, is it a product that's, that's good on enveloped viruses? We don't need to have a product that specifically will work on norovirus, poliovirus, so, so the, the traditional difficult ones. We just need this basic limited virucidal effect. The standard EN testing that's done for these products is fully is, is, is fully sufficient. We don't need any anything extra on that. We also don't need to go for RKI listed um, products. We don't need this isn't um, a, a, an outbreak where we have to break out the the real hardcore um, heavy duty disinfectants which are kept for for the really dangerous stuff that's difficult to kill. So we don't, we don't need to um, uh, use specific products. If we have our normal disinfectants, which are also claiming that they have um, effic efficacy against the limited virucidal range, so the envelope viruses, that's fine. We don't need to go for the expanded range of things. 
And how long can we use a solution or as an opened product? Yes, now th this is this is really critical. There's no point in using a disinfectant if it's used wrongly or if it's expired and doesn't work anymore, because then you're you're just you're just wasting your time and you're putting people at risk unnecessarily. So do pay attention to this. So, for example, alcoholic disinfectants will typically last about six months after opening. Um, I think in these days, I'd be surprised if anyone has a bottle of alcoholic hand sanitizer lying around for more than <laughs> six months. So, um, but pay, pay, pay attention to that. Don't use old products that have, that have expired. Um, other types of products, they have an expiry date written on, on the package. If it's beyond that date, it's probably not safe to use. Um, what's, what's critical is if we're looking at um, use solutions that we might be generating. So you might make a, a solution of disinfectant which you want to use um, over the course of a few hours. That's fine and cert for certain products you can do that. You can't do it for all, but for certain ones you can. And when it makes sense to do that, that it's, it's good. But please be careful. If your use solution is valid for, for example, eight hours, um, if it's based on quaternary ammonium compounds, for example, um, only use it for that time. Don't go extending it unnecessarily. And also, when you're working with these products, don't contaminate them. If you've got a, a bulk solution in a, in a bucket or whatever, a, a ready-to-use solution, make sure you're not contaminating it because that's going to break down or reduce the efficacy of the disinfectant over time, especially if you're using one that's based on, on chlorine or hydrogen peroxide. These are very reactive. And if you get dirt in, into those solutions, that dirt is going to react with the chlorine or the hydrogen peroxide. And over time, you get less and less efficacy from your, from your use solution. So it's important, to, if once you've made up your solution, use it within the time that's specified that you're allowed to use it in and keep it clean in that time. Don't let anything contaminate it. Great. So, and now we go through the different areas. So we have here the public areas like schools, kindergartens, supermarkets. Uh, we have offices and give you some guidelines along these different areas. In addition, we're also looking at the lodging and care homes and give you also some ideas or around different hygiene measures you need to keep in mind in these different areas. But before, I have a question to Scott. Do you know how many surfaces do you touch in half an hour? Any idea? Um, it's a lot. It's a lot more than people would ever think that they're, that they're touching. Yes, 300 surfaces in three, 30 minutes. That's really a lot. And you see here some of the really uh, high touch objects on the left hand side. So keep them in mind uh, and also keep in mind that you need to clean these surfaces often and to, that you need to have a proper hand hygiene. And we get so many questions on hand hygiene and so many recommendations. One say you should wash your hands. Others should say you should disinfect your hands. Scott, what do you think? What's the best thing to do? Um, normal situations, I would say washing your hands is going to be enough, just in, in normal day-to-day -day life. By washing your hands, you're removing the dirt off your hands, but you're also physically going to remove the virus from your hands. And luckily as well, with the type of um, chemistry that we have in soaps, the surfactants that are in soaps, will actually also attack the virus to a certain degree. So with normal soap, you're actually, you're going to be killing some of the virus in your hand, but you're physically removing it from your hand very effectively as well. Um, when we get into different applications, then we're going to have different needs. For example, um, if you're working in a food area, it's often advisable to wash your hands first to remove any, any dirt. And then after that, you might want to disinfect as a second step. Or you could do that with a, a two-in-one um, antibacterial hand soap. When we look at, um, at healthcare um, or, or long-term long -term care, um, the requirements are going to be higher there. So the disinfection step is actually going to be critical in, in that situation because you're working with immunosuppressed people or people who are weak, and there even the, 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 the tiniest residues of the virus are going to be causing your problems. So the, the disinfection aspect will be a lot higher. Yeah, and that's a very important point to say. So usually, depending on the country that you're working in, it might be uh, even by law that you need to disinfect your hands in a kitchen area when handling food. And usually, I say uh, wash before and then disinfect, but only disinfect dry hands, very important. 
And in many countries in care, there's the other way around that you need to disinfect first and then wash your hands. So it usually depends on the country you're working in, but keep these steps in mind and uh, in doubt then ask really the uh, health uh, authority in your country if you do not know how it is in your country. And these are the eight steps uh, when really disinfecting the hand. I think you all know this, you're experts, you know how to disinfect the hand. But we cannot say it often enough how important this, it is to stick to these processes. 30 seconds, that's the time that you should disinfect your hands. But keep in mind, during these 30 seconds, your hand needs to stay wet. And that's often made mistakes. 30 seconds, that's how long you need to keep your hand, hands wet during the disinfectant. And there are many nice songs and videos uh, on the internet available if you'd like to train your staff that are really effective. And now you can see uh, uh, on, uh, on in the column above the different areas. We'll go step by step through these different areas. And we have uh, the standard procedures, the specific touch points. We will not go in detail through the standard procedures because you anyhow have defined them per side. That's what you do anyhow, all the time. As said, you will get this. If you'd like to adapt your procedures, you can look through these procedures that we suggest in detail afterwards, but we assume you know how to do this. We will more focus on the uh, then remediation uh, procedures, and we will also uh, mention some specific touch points. And for the case of the guest room and residence room guidelines, uh, you see some of the specific touch points that uh, have a higher risk uh, in the green column. And I want really to highlight the remote control. Scott, do you have any suggestions how to clean the remote control? Yeah, the, re the remote control is, is um, a common one that people are a little bit uncomfortable touching, and, and rightly so, because it's something that everyone who comes into the room will be in contact with. Um, it's a te technically, it's a difficult thing to clean. You can't spray it with a product because you've got a risk of the product seeping in past the buttons and getting to the electronics and destroying it. So what you need to do is you need to use a wipe or have product sprayed onto a towel. And then with that, you're going to be rubbing the, the touch pads and, and the, the plastic surfaces of, of the, the remote control. Um, it's difficult to do, um, but we have the benefit of the mechanical um, effect here. So because of the towel rubbing over the buttons, we're actually going to be physically removing some of the dirt and, and possible virus residues there on, on that. And then with the, the disinfectant in the cloth, you're going to be killing what's there on the surface too. So, it's really a, a, a combination of the gentle mechanical action with safe use of the, the chemical. And also keep in mind the uh, 72 hours that I mentioned before, the survival time of the virus, because just in case you want to be completely safe, just leave it for 72 hours to be safe for, uh, from coronavirus. But keep in mind there might be other bacteria and microorganisms on the remote control. So uh, then in terms of remediation, we have some special procedures. When you had an uh, infected person in one of the room, then the recommendation is, if possible, to really close the room for 24 hours or better longer before you start your cleaning and disinfecting process. It's also good that you have some air circulation in the room before you start cleaning and really close it so that nobody can get into the room. And that's only working, of course, when the patient or the ill person has already left the room. And then it's really time to disinfect all hard surfaces. And uh, you can also be a little bit less uh, wearing all the PPE. If the person is still in the room, then you need to wear the PPE that I've shown before to really protect yourself. And uh, really important is to know anyhow, if you have a ill person or not in the room, you should increase the frequency of the room cleaning. It's also important to isolate symptomatic employees and guests as soon as possible. And we have received many questions and probably Scott can help us in answering these different questions. So one question was, uh, can COVID-19 be transmitted with a bedding, with a linen? It's very, it's very unlikely, to be honest. Um, if you follow your normal hygiene um, procedures, you wouldn't give dirty bed linen to another guest to use. So if you've taken out your, your, your bed linen and you've, you've washed it with your normal process, 
the surfactants in the, the washing detergent, along with the, the increased temperatures, they're going to remove and inactivate a lot of the, the virus. And also then by drying it properly afterwards, you're putting it in an environment where the, the virus is not comfortable and will not survive for a long time. So by the time you get your bed linen back, it should be fine and, and safe to work with. And what about the sanitary facilities in the room? Um, this should just be your, following your standard procedures. Any um, high frequency uh, contact surfaces, these should just be cleaned and disinfected just as you normally would un under normal circumstances. And uh, the last question was, are there any surfaces I should probably not touch? Or I need to be careful with about the contamination? Um, I would say there's nothing you shouldn't, you should, there's nothing you should ignore, but anything where you can imagine that people are going to be touching it. There you have a risk that if someone had coughed previously on the surface shortly before the new guests have come, that there's a risk then that someone can, can take it, can um, pick up the virus on their fingers. So any sort of switches or handles that people can be looking at, it's really important to, to pay attention to them. So uh, in terms of the public uh, areas, and this might be anything really from hotel public areas, from the supermarket, the shopping trolleys, anything. Also there you have your standard procedures in place. Anyhow, I really want to uh, highlight here uh, as already said, the switches, uh, tables and chairs, but also the shopping trolleys. Um, and what I also see, uh, the coffee and beverage stations. Also keep them in mind as specific touch points and have a special cleaning procedure for them in place. And in terms of the remediation procedures, I mean, we said already a lot of things around this uh, to increase the cleaning and disinfection frequency is pretty clear so far. Also to provide hand sanitizers uh, makes sense. Um, but what makes sense in public areas, really consider limiting non-essential vendors. Really think about who is necessary to get into your site and whom do you not need right now. And really restrict it if it's possible, if you have a certain fear. Uh, and it's usually follow really the guidance by the public health authorities. And in terms of the public areas, I think we already answered the first question here around the surface uh, that you can really touch all the different surfaces there. There's only one thing that can make sense that you just avoid touching a surface. If you're really afraid, you can open, for example, a door with your elbow. That's totally okay. Uh, that's what you can do. And as I know, some of the schools might open soon and there might be some graduations coming depending on the country you're in. And we're getting a lot of questions around, well, what do I need to do? What around the PCs, keyboards, tables? And that's uh, quite similar to what we just uh, heard from Scott about the remote control. Uh, also increase there the frequency of the cleaning. Uh, all the services uh, like the key to keyboard can be similar cleaned like the remote controls. For PCs, be a little bit careful and lap laptops just clean them properly and you can decrease also the amount of uh, viruses there and also have the hand hygiene in mind. And uh, yeah, especially students should pay uh, attention to proper hand hygiene. And with that said, I lead over to the food service guidelines. And that's where we also have now two different, two special uh, yeah, guidelines, one for the con food contact services and one for the non food contact services. And also there, again, the standard procedures, that's what you have in place anyhow. And the specific touch points can be several. It can be really from glassware, from bar tops, uh, tools, whatever, keep them in mind and clean them properly. Uh, and what about the remediation process, Scott? Right, so if you're working in food service, I'm sure you have procedures in place for what to do if there's an outbreak of norovirus, what to do if somebody vomits in your restaurant or in your store. Um, so this is, this, is, this is fine because any of these procedures we have, and even just our standard procedures are going to be good enough. So just be very strict on the procedures that you're following. So if you have standard procedures for um, manually um, washing your wares and, and, and sanitizing them, stick to that but make sure it's done it's done properly if anything do it a little bit more often you don't have to go crazy but a bit more frequent frequently will reduce the the risk of virus being passed from one worker to the for, to the other in there the same with if you've got a, a buffet or something like that where you're going to have members of the public coming in and touching surfaces 
make sure every surface that they touch, which could be a spoon in a buffet, um, make sure that, that they're actually being cleaned um, more often than you normally would do. Um, and just, yeah, make sure that all of your, your systems in general are working correctly. So if you're using any equipment to make sure you're dispensing your product or if you're using um, wear washing, um, make sure that all of those systems are actually working properly and people know how to use them correctly. So again, we've talked before about the importance of training and this is going to be critical again that your workers actually know how each application is supposed to be cleaned and sanitized properly. When we talk about wear washing, wear washing is, is, is great um, from a, a hygiene point of view. Because of the heat and the detergent that you're using, you're going to be killing you know, huge amounts of, of any germs that, that get in there. And if it's actually working properly, then you will come out with, with properly sanitized dishes or, or, or wares out of the machine. What's important though is um, your whole procedure around the wear washing. So in the machine, if that's Tuned up, tuned properly, and working properly, everything's fine. But what about everything that goes around it? So, how are you bringing your dirty wares to the machine and your clean wares away? Are you making sure there's no cross contamination there? That the person who's carrying your dirty wares to the machine is not picking up with the same hands the clean wares that are coming out the other side. So, be very careful of the the logistics end of things here and your, your processes. If you notice that there's a problem with your machine, that the temperature is not getting hot enough which is defined as being needed to get to the um, hygienic aspect. So 60 degrees for the wash temperature and 80 for the rinse. If you're not getting up to that level, you will need to use a detergent which contains a sanitizing component. Typically chlorine bleach will be, will be in the, the cleaner there. Um, and as well, if, you've, if your store has been closed for a longer period of time, you might have to pay attention to the risk of, of um, water quality. So if you have any water sumps anywhere or water that can stay standing in pipes when your restaurant or, or whatever is closed for a period of time, make sure you're cleaning that out of properly so you don't have the risk of any biofilm or bacteria that could have formed in those areas being passed into your food or, or onto your wares before serving them to customers. That's actually a very important point, especially if you have water softeners in place also keep in mind, uh, if they're not used for more than 48 hours, you should normally clean and disinfect them properly. So that's also some of the things to keep in mind. Yeah, so, um, so all of those aspects are, are things we should typically be looking at anyway in our day-to-day -day lives and our jobs. You know, these are standard things for, for food safety. And again, when we talk about how to disinfect a hard surface, which could come in contact with food, we're going to use the same procedures as ever. So you want to remove any of the dirt that's on the surface, and then you're going to use a, um, a cleaner disinfectant, for example. Make sure in this situation you're using one with a limited virucidal efficacy. Let it work for the right amount of time. This, this is critical. Spraying a disinfectant on a surface and wiping it away two seconds later is not going to give you the efficacy that you really need. And this, this applies to standard food safety as it does to, to the virus situation now. Make sure you're sticking to the right contact times as written on the product, and then rinse the surface to remove any trace of disinfectants before it comes into contact with food again. Yes, and in terms of non-food uh, contacts are also there, or as already said, you have the standard procedures in place. So please stick to them uh, as already said, and for the specific touch points, there are some things you should really keep in mind. For example, if you have a restaurant, keep in mind menus, bill folders, or bands. Or what about the computers and keypad? So really have all the different touch points in your mind when cleaning and disinfecting the restaurant properly. Yeah, and again, you know, when we talk about um, non-food contact surfaces, as we said, for the food contact surfaces, it's it's the same procedure as ever. Just stick to it properly. For the non-food contact, it's going to be the same. Increase the procedure or increase the frequency of when we're talking about um, surfaces that will be that will be um, touched frequently by everyone. Um, follow your standard personal hygiene. Keep people washing their hands, and make sure people understand how to do it properly. So the training factor has to be up to date. So from a practical point of view, 
similar to the way we did it for the um, food surfaces. It'll be the same here, except with a non-food contact surface. In many cases, you don't need to rinse the surface after use. So after you've let the surface um, react with the disinfectant for long enough, you can just dry it and let it air dry and your job is done. And also for the kitchen area, we've received many, many different questions. And one uh, was, for example, if I work in a kitchen and I get in contact with the wastewater or with the food leftovers, is, the, is it critical in regards to COVID-19? No. Um, this isn't the, the normal way of, of, of um, transfer um, of the virus, so this would be considered a, a low risk but consider your standard food safety um, hygiene practices and if you do get in contact with them make sure you've washed your hands and, and sanitized your, your hands afterwards again properly perfect and i think we also already answered the second question saying is a change uh, necessary in the way how we clean there's no change ne necessary you just need to apply to the good hygiene practices and really think about the frequency uh, clean more often Another question for you, Scott. What about the floor? Do I need now to disinfect the floor? Usually not. Um, in, in, a, in a kitchen area, floors are not the way that, um, that viruses are going to be transferred from one person to another um, because we don't have this droplet transmission from a floor going in to be inhalable. So keeping your floor clean like normal will be good enough. And what about sneezing at work? Same as how you're sneezing outside of work, sneeze and cough into your elbows and keep your hands washed regularly so you're not actually gathering any germs on them. Great. And now in terms of restaurants, and we are completely aware that uh, this is only partially applicable as some of the restaurants I have switched to to go. But nevertheless, uh, they will open again and there are some really interesting questions. The first one was, can I get uh, COVID-19 via the table? No, so the, the table itself um, would be no more risky than uh, your typical door handles and things. So it's a surface that if it's cleaned regularly and disinfected regularly, everything should be fine. Um, but it's not something to be afraid of. And what about the napkins? Again, napkins, um, we've talked about um, uh, materials, um, so cloths uh, as not being the main and transmitter of viruses. The same would be for, for cloth napkins. Just make sure that they're, that they're being washed properly afterwards, which you should do anyway. Um, but in general, if you're going to have napkins, don't just leave them out lying around the tables so that if people go by, they could cough on them because the next person who takes it then could use it to wipe their mouth. So only hand out the napkins to people as needed. And I think we already discussed around the wear washing process and the dishes, but what about really the glasses I cannot put in a dish machine that I need to clean manually. True, but but as we said as well, the, 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 the surfactants that are used in a lot of these products, like in hand soaps, are actually going to attack the virus as well. So by the, the process of actually washing the glass, you've got the mechanical action there by, by, by rubbing it. You've got the surfactant there, which is going to help remove any traces of virus from the glass and actually react with them to start weakening the virus and, and destroying it. And then afterwards, of course, you're going to dry your glasses. And by drying the glass again, you're going to be polishing off any residues that could still be there. And also so there, procedures. also there to mention, keep in mind the gloss you use to dry the glass. And this needs to be washed carefully. And that's usually a higher risk than the glass itself. To really think about all the uh, cleaning materials you're using to really wash them properly. And we come to textile hygiene later on anyhow but just that mentioned in addition. And no, switching to the canteen. Um, that's often when you go into the canteen, you have the stations where you can get your cutleries and napkins. What about the risk for COVID-19 getting with the stations? Yeah, so again, the, 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 risk, the risk is low, but it is an area where you're going to have interaction between people. Person one will, will touch something, person two will come along a minute later and, and touch it as well. So if you don't need these, if, if, you, can, if you can eliminate using them, that's, that's good. Um, otherwise, find ways to, to keep it as hygienic as possible. Yeah, for example, uh, recommendations is not to fill them too full so they can easily really get them. Uh, and we also recommend to put the hand disinfectant in front of the canteen to really that your guests are yeah. staying safe. 
And a question is also often coming around, uh, is it safe to eat in a canteen? Yes. Um, e eating in a canteen is fine. Make sure you're keeping your distance to other people. Um, and the, the spit protection barriers that are used um, in general in, in canteen settings, they should still be used to prevent um, any transfer of somebody coughing and, the, and the, the, the virus being transferred over to someone else. Yes, and just to keep in mind, canteens and restaurants, they have mainly ghosts because you cannot keep the distance to the people. It's not because of the food that's being spoiled by COVID, it's really because of the distance to people. And I think that's very important to notice why that's so important during these times. So now going to the restrooms. As I said, we already uh, mentioned the standard procedures that you have usually in place, but also there, keep in mind the diff specific touch points. And they might be different for the different uh, restrooms. For example, the baby changing station, or also have in mind uh, the toilet paper dispensers, they all might be specific touch points that you need to clean and disinfect properly. And also there, uh, always keep in mind the uh, personal equipment, uh, also provide a hand sanitizer in the kitchen during these times, but most important is the hand soap. Clean your hand really properly with hand soap and, this during, and for the 30 minutes. That's really so essential during these times. Um, in terms of the sanitary areas, also there, I think we already answered some of the questions. So we also already answered the first uh, thing, uh, what do we need to uh, pay attention? That's what we already said so far. Um, but really, perhaps you can say again, when do I need to disinfect the sanitary area? Yeah, so disinfection um, is going to be important if it's if you're in a, a, a health or long-term care situation there, it's really going to be critical. Um, yes. If you have, um, there's, there's a lot of um, regulations around these sort of things. So, so in certain situations, the authorities will demand that the whole sanitary area is regularly disinfected. So you need to be aware of, of what the, the, the local regulations are about that. Exactly. And uh, for all the sanitary areas uh, linked to a resident or guest room, that's the recommendation for a, a hotel, for example. As soon as the guests are changing, you need to disinfect also the guest rooms, the uh, restrooms, sorry. In terms of the laundry guidelines, uh, also there are standard procedures as uh, known anyhow, and the specific touch points, they are also important to know. Think about the controllers of the washer and the dryers, about the light switches the cards you're using. So many interesting uh, touch points you have in a laundry. Uh, and there it's also important to have the different remediation processes in mind. So we really strongly recommend to avoid contact with skin and clothes with the contaminated laundry. Use proper uh, gloves and uh, coats when for the laundry collection. If there is no PP, uh, no COVID-19 case known, you do not really need to use the complete uh, overall that I showed before, the special uh, PPEs, but you should really think about covering the, uh, your hands with gloves and also wearing a coat. Uh, in addition, think about the storage of the textiles. Store and transport them properly uh, in suitable containers. They should be lockable and tear resistant, for example, these blue plastic bags, uh, but they should be thick enough. And also keep in mind to close the containers. And you usually should also write on it what's in there that you can really uh, yeah, clean them properly and in time. So time preparation is very important. And, and it's quite similar to also the wear washing procedures. Have the right program in mind, the right time, and the right product concentration. That's always linked to the product itself. And do not overfill the machine. And we usually recommend, uh, especially for our businesses, to use an industrial machine uh, because there you have the chance to uh, put all these different uh, processes in place. Um, also keep in mind that you disinfect and clean the transport rollers properly. And also think about the rim of the machine and the door. That you really also do not recontaminate the laundry when it's cleaned. Um, in general, because many people ask around the temperatures, COVID-19 is uh, killed at 60 degrees Celsius. That's important to know. And uh, that's why we usually recommend to have the 60 degrees in place. However, it always depends, of course, what you're washing. Uh, if you do not reach the 60 degrees, 
uh, you can use some uh, sanitizer components, for example. Uh, that's also recommended. And also keep in mind, depending the area you are working in, that you might need other temperatures depending on the risk you are having. For example, for care homes, you might need other procedures in place. Um, all in all, we recommend, but this should be normal uh, process anyhow, a clean and a dirty side. Uh, also use different gloves when handling clean and dirty laundry and do not store damp laundry overnight. And of course, even if you wear gloves, have a look at the proper hand hygiene. That's really important. And some more laundry guidelines. Uh, I think we already answered uh, the COVID, uh, the, what do we need to do when really touching laundry that's uh, infected by COVID-19. Um, but what's not yet been answered, and that's what I'd like to uh, ask you, Scott, what about uh, using disposable wipes? Isn't this easier instead of really yeah, washing all the textiles? Um, easier, yes. Um, disposable wipes. Um, the disposable wipes have, have their place. They, they can be great. They can also be a curse. Um, from an environmental point of view and, and a, a cost efficiency point of view, disposable wipes are not good. Um, the using reusable wipes is, is much better for the environment and more economical. But in certain circumstances, they're the best thing to do for the convenience and the, the, the speed that you can actually um, work with them. So you really have to have to balance up. Um, I've got a disinfection wipe. Will that work? I've got a um, or a, 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 sorry, a, a disposable wipe. Um, will that work for, for for the application? You need to consider the whole process and not just um, the, the 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 simple thing of well, I don't have to worry about my washing machine. Think about the other factors involved as well. And now, what about the employees' guidelines? Just I think we've mentioned a lot of it, but perhaps you can summarize the most important things again. Yeah, so um, so the hygiene etiquette uh, and, and coughing, so hand washing, hand washing, hand washing, it's really number one on the list. Um, the, the, the employees have to understand that and have to follow it. That's really critical for the sake of all of your employees. Um, paying attention to people's health. If someone is showing any symptoms or if someone fears they might have symptoms, don't let them in to, to work, make them stay at home. Um, because they're, they're going to be, by doing that, you're protecting your other workers and your customers as well. Um, figure out a continuity plan. So figure out how are you going to work if, the case, if it actually does happen that someone calls in sick? Um, who, who's key um, to, to keeping the business running? Is it possible that you can have people working from home or working in shifts maybe, where they're going to come less into contact with each other to reduce the risk of anything happening, of, of, um, the disease being passed between between your workers. Um, for, uh, just as an example for that, for, for us in, in the lab at the moment, my team are working in shifts. They, they never actually work face to face in the lab at the moment. They work at different times to prevent an, any anything happening. Um, make sure people have what they need to, 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 to work in the procedures. So have they got enough um, hygiene materials? Have they got enough um, tissues, soap, hand sanitizer, surface sanitizers, is everything available for them to be able to, to do their job safely? And very important is education of the employees. Make sure they know the standard procedures so well that they're not going to be making mistakes because as you said, your standard procedures will get you through this situation when it comes to cleaning and disinfection. So they really need to know what they're doing and also understand all of these extra procedures linked to frequent hand washing, why it's important for them to do that and follow those procedures. That is for the good of everybody. It's not just to make their lives more difficult. Yes, and uh, as we get this question so often, again, what do I need to do if I have a proven COVID-19 case in an institution? And then it's really important, first thing to do, follow the instruction of the responsible health authority. That's the very first thing because it depends always on your side, on the institution, what you need to do. And there might be special measures in place. Uh, so that's the first thing to do. But in addition, we have here again, the summary. We, I think we mentioned everything so far, but here is a summary of the different uh, things you should do to break the chain. We will share this with you afterwards. We'll not go through it in detail right now, uh, but as I say, that's what we will share anyhow later with you. Keep in mind to do everything to break the infection chain. That's important to know. And some key sources we'd like to share with you. I already mentioned some of them. 
So important uh, for you is really the World Health Organization. Then we have the ECDC situation report that's really a, a useful source, the John Hopkins dashboard, the velometer where you get really uh, data about the uh, current situation across the world. Uh, then we have the uh, RKI, that's the German Institute, that's also available in English language. And of course, we'd like to uh, let you know that we are working on the renewal of our eClub homepage. You already have lots of information there per segment and uh, all the latest information are there on this homepage that you can find quite easily. With that said, um, we think together we can make a difference. We will survive this crisis. We will work together closely. Um, and as already mentioned, we are really good in time. We are now, uh, through our presentations, we'll now go into the Q&A. For those who say, I already know everything I need, thanks for your attention. Feel free to stay as long as you like or to go off now. Uh, and for the others, we'll now go directly into the Q&A session. So many questions have come in. And let me quickly check uh, how to answer them. One second. I need to make the field bigger. Um, so one of the areas is really uh, what about what's the most successful way to disinfect a spa area? And this always depends on uh, how your spa area is really, what you have there, which uh, things you, uh, which uh, tools you have there, and therefore it depends. So uh, usually I say clean and disinfect more often. If it's anyhow closed right now, then usually that 72 hours already decrease the numbers of viruses uh, so there will no virus be anymore after reopening again, but never you should clean and disinfect everything properly. Um, so, and I already said you will get the presentations because these are also one of the questions. Yes, probably a question to use, Scott, uh, there are different types of gloves available. Um, do you have any kind of suggestion how you do use, which gloves to use when? Right, so, um, okay, uh, for, you, you're going to need to look at what the application is the gloves are being used for. Um, if it's an application which is only being used for a short amount of time, the standard light disposable um, latex gloves or for people who are latex allergies, latex free versions, um, they can be okay for, for small applications. If you're going to be working for a longer period of time, um, I wouldn't use the, the, the light gloves, then it would be better to have something which is a bit more robust. There's, um, you could go up, depending on, on how the contact to chemicals are going to, so, sorry, I'm going too fast. Um, if you're just doing um, your normal job and, and you want to add in uh, gloves as a feature, so then you can look at the, the simple um, disposable gloves to be used for, for short periods of time where you might be in contact with, with customers. Um, if it's something where you're going to be in contact with chemicals, so if you're asking someone to, to clean and disinfect your restaurant or, or your, your store, your, your, your room, whatever it is, where they're going to be in contact for, for longer periods, you might want to give them more sturdy gloves, which are going to be easier to use for longer times. If you're using um, something like a nitrile glove, which is actually reusable for extended periods, do pay attention that they're left to dry properly regularly on the inside as well. Um, to prevent any any damage to your skin. But in general, um, if you've got the gloves, pay attention to keeping them clean. And if they get if they get dirty, you're going to have to sanitize them or disinfect them again um, in between or dispose of them and, and take new ones. But don't use gloves just to sacrifice on not washing your hands. You still need to keep washing your hands regularly. Yes, thank you for this. Uh, next question, very good one. Uh, can face shield uh, visas be an alternative to the mask? Yes, they can. You need to have just a barrier. And that's what we see in many supermarkets right now in many countries, that they have this kind of shields everywhere, this plexiglass or whatever, that really have a, a barrier to the people. As long as you can really have uh, minimized the, this, the, the barrier and the contact between different people, then it makes sense. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, you can use these barriers for sure. Um, then there is one question around the cleaning solution 
for remote controlling gas stream. I think that's what we already answered in detail. Um, and uh, it also makes sense because I know this, this remote control is really a topic. So if you have a care home anyhow, I would recommend to use a special uh, remote control that can be cleaned easily. If not, you can also put the plastic around it. Really put the plastic back around it that can really clean easily. Uh, I've seen many creative solutions there. This might keep your other guests safe there. So let me see. So many questions. I need to go through it step by step. Um, another round face shield. So something around. Is the German government doing any type of cleanliness guarantee certification for reopening hotels, bar, etc.? I have not heard anything, heard anything around this. Um, what we are currently working is from an equal perspective on a reopening program that we will ro roll out shortly, arts and country language that we will then share with you later on. Um, then, can you provide, uh, can you, can products to disinfect services also be used for hands? I think that's a question for you, uh, Scott. What about using disinfectants for hand? Oh, right. Yeah. Um, okay. There's a couple of aspects here. First of all, the legal aspect, um, the requirements for disinfectants for skin are different compared to the requirements for disinfectants for surfaces. Um, so when we develop a, a product and test it and register it then with the authorities, we have to say what the application is we're going to use it in. And if we were to use it on skin, there's, there's certain tests we would have to carry out to show that it works um, on skin and doesn't cause the damage. Um, so from a legal point of view, in, in, in case of an inspection, they could look at your product and say, well, you shouldn't use this on skin, it's not registered for that. Um, from a practical point of view, um, I have to say that if you compare the formulation of a surface disinfectant with a skin disinfectant, um, at first glance, they might look similar. But the surface disinfectant is, is designed just to do the disinfection. When we talk about the hand products, we have a lot of skin care ingredients built into them because otherwise alcohol in particular dries out skin very quickly um, and will very quickly leave you with, with dry skin, cracked skin, if you don't have these ingredients in it to, to improve the moisture content in your hands and keep your hands safe. So short answer would be, I wouldn't recommend doing it. Okay, uh, next question is what about uh, UV lamps uh, uh, and their effect on viruses. Yeah, we received this question often. We know that UV is really uh, decreasing the amount of viruses and uh, it's helping that it's dying. But there is no process in place that says you can really use it as a disinfectant uh, for it uh, for COVID-19. So we really would ask you to stick to the normal uh, process as suggested, but it can help in addition. Uh, but there is no study has been done on this topic. Therefore, we, we are careful in answering this. The next one is very in interesting uh, because that's often coming. Uh, will surface become resistant, for example, to and speed or other disinfectant when it's used daily? I think, Scott, that's what you can answer. Yeah, so um, we're all aware of the risks of um, antibiotic resistance. Um, what we're looking at here with, with disinfectants, we're in a different league compared to antibiotics. Um, we don't have to worry about um, resistance of organisms if disinfectants are used correctly. With antibiotics, they work on stopping one very small but key function of the bacteria to prevent it from growing. So if the bacteria suddenly learns how to avoid this one little process, which it can't do anymore, then it can live. So a, an example to make this a bit more understandable, an antibiotic might say, okay, I'm going to come and sew the mouth shut of this bacteria so it can't eat. The bacteria all go, oh, I can't eat, and they die. One of those bacteria can go, okay, I don't have a mouth, but I can, I can inhale the food through my nose into my stomach that way, and I can keep living. And this is antibacterial um, mutations that we see, which will lead then to um, antibiotic resistance. With disinfectants, the way we're killing the, the bacteria um, and with the viruses as well now is 
much more hardcore. We go in and we destroy them. So it's like coming in and you know dropping a bomb on it. There's no way that a bacteria or virus can react quickly enough to develop an immunity to the way our products are working. So there's no risk that over time they're going to develop um, resistance to it. This is why for disinfectants, we don't have to worry about the resistance the way antibiotics do. So the next question is, uh, as I said, uh, the virus droplets can enter the body with a mucus on uh, eyes and nose and also the mouth. And the question is, can it get through the ears? And at the moment, there are no studies available that you can get COVID-19 with the ears. So I can just say, link to the studies, no. <laughs> Might change, but not at the moment. And I don't think so because I've not heard of any other cases that's transmitted via the ears so far. The next one, also a very good one. Um, what about uh, the feather down linen items? Uh, are there any proven procedures for cleaning them when used in rooms for quarantine? Yeah, that's a, a very interesting point. Uh, what we suggest, everything that you can wash that you should really disinfect and all the other linen items that cannot be washed properly. It always depends. I mean, if the room is if nobody's in there and you have the chance to leave it uh, for up to 72 days without somebody inside then you're pretty safe but also if you put the linen around uh, uh, something or over something the risk of really getting the disease through the pillow is so low so i think yeah we can never say there is no risk but it's very very low anything to add from your side scott on this point no, I, I was thinking exactly the same that you just said. Um, give the material if if you can't wash them, give the materials good time to to dry and air out in between use between different people, um, and that will definitely hugely reduce the the risks involved. And and the risks I would I would also see in general as low even from the start. So having this period of seventy two hours between uses, if possible, would would be optimal. Yes. So the next one, very good question. Also, uh, Google's can usually be reused. How to disinfect them? Um, I would probably clean them. Really, I said as you do with your hands, put soap on them or any other normal uh, detergent. Uh, wash them under water. Use if properly warm water, not too hot, and just uh, rinse them properly for the thirty seconds, and you can wash all the viruses off. And this should be enough. I would be careful in disinfecting Google's. Depends on the Google's you have because they can get blind uh, by a disinfectant. So I would recommend really to wash them properly. Um, another thing, uh, very, yeah, very interesting also, how long should gloves be worn? Scott, any guideline from your side around the duration of wearing gloves? Um, oh, difficult. Um, that's really a difficult one to, to, <laughs> to define. Um, for me, I would say as, as short as possible, um, unless you're going to be disinfecting them, you know, at regular intervals while, while you're wearing them. So it's just, you know, people, like I said, when I, when I mentioned earlier, when people use gloves, they, they, they feel invincible. And I've been in, in my local supermarket here and you saw people working there with gloves and the gloves were brown. And you're going, well, you know, they're obviously not clean gloves anymore. And you could see them, you know, fixing their hair and things still with them. So make sure you don't get to that stage try if you're wearing gloves keep the focus on hand hygiene like you would if you weren't wearing the gloves so keep telling people to, to regularly disinfect or, or, or wash them great uh, the next question is what about buffets in all inclusive resource uh, well it's the same as before all the uh, different things you use on the buffets should be really cleaned as often and changed as often as possible and uh, put them in the wear washing machine and it's not really the risk of getting the food with the, uh, the disease with the food. The risk is really that the, the different people get infecting by a close contact. So with, I would be more worried around getting COVID from another person via, uh, than with the food. I think that's important to notice there. So we already said around the gloves, um, that there are different uh, gloves in place. Um, yeah, also interesting. Um, if you apply the hand sanitizers on the hand, is there a longer effect? Is that something that you'd like to answer? Applying hand sanitizers on hands, it's very... Um, yes, if you, if you, you say again? If you apply the hand sanitizers on the hand, 
how long is this safe to use? So how long do they really uh, act on the hand? Okay. Sorry, yeah. So the hand sanitizer will only work while it's wet. Once the, once it has you've put it on and you've been rubbing it into your hands, once it's dried, the effect of the hand sanitizer is basically ending then. Um it's the when you have the 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 alcohol and the sanitizer, when that's able to react with the virus, that's when you're actually going to be killing it. Once there's no more ethanol there, then there's nothing else to be reacting with the, the virus. You're not going to increase your, your kill rate of the virus anymore. So it's something that has to be used regularly. There's no lasting protection with it. Perfect. Um, then there are the questions concerning uh, product recommendation. I, I have not mentioned this on purpose because it might vary according to the different regions you are in. In this case, Oasis Pro 20 is working against, uh, is, is effective against the virus, but please get in touch with your Ecolab uh, colleague because they have the actual available product list for you with the right procedures in mind. Um, then uh, for the pool and spa area, this question is coming again and again. Uh, the same for the spa areas is uh, that you need to clean frequently touched uh, surfaces as often as possible. At the moment, there are no studies saying that it can be transmitted via the pool water. Uh, but it's just at the moment, it hasn't been tested so far. Uh, as soon as we know more, we'll let you know. But as I said, uh, it's the same again, just disinfect all the different services that are frequently used. Uh, again, with the surface sanitizer to be used, just have a look uh, at what Scott said, that it's effective uh, for viruses. And to have certain products in place, please contact your uh, eClub colleague. They have all the products in mind and they know what will help you. Um, would you recommend chef service buffet via live stations? Mm, honestly, as long as you can keep the distance to your uh, guests and also to your colleagues, both is fine. Just really keep the good hygiene and practice in mind and keep the distance. That's the most important uh, to stay safe during these times. Next question is air conditioners. Yeah, there, at the moment, there is no study saying that this disease can be transmitted via air conditioners. That's just at the moment, the studies. So we do not have the latest data, we, uh, latest studies for this. At the moment, we do not know it. It makes totally sense to clean and disinfect the air conditioners frequently with the procedure. Uh, but at the moment, we do not know that it's transmit, transmitted via the air conditioners. Anything to add from your side, Scott? Yeah, just on that. So um, we should remember that, you know, it's not like bacteria which can grow um, and, and multiply in the air conditioning system. Um, with this, it's, you know, whatever particles of whatever virus um, particles we have there, that's all there is. So it's not that you can get this into an air conditioner and it's going to multiply and then start spreading out. Once you start blowing it out through an air conditioner, you're actually diluting the virus in the air then. So the risk um, won't be or shouldn't be increasing at least from, from a theoretical point of view yes then there is a question uh, rather linen napkins or paper ones it, at the end it's the same as with the textiles as long as you really uh, clean them properly you can also use the linen napkins there, it, it's just a matter of uh, economic uh, versus sustainable reasons so it's up to you what's more convenient for your needs um then is it important to have test kits to check the final disinfection concentration? Anything from your side on this, Scott? Um, yes, I, ideally you should know um, if your product is, is being dispensed correctly. Um, this would only apply if you're using concentrates, which you want to be diluting on site. Um, the, 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 when, when the dispensing system is, is installed or, or being serviced, um, the Ecolab territory manager is there should be checking and making sure that, that, that it's working properly. Um, so you shouldn't get big fluctuations in, in, your, in your concentration. For a lot of products, we do have um, test strips available um, to be able to check. Um, so you have a, 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 a good indication of whether it's the, the right concentration or not. Mm -hmm. Thank you. How safe are staff members when dealing with guests? It is usually depend, depends how much distance you have to the guests. So if you really have the two meters distance, then you are quite safe. I say there's no 100% during these times. Uh, and if it's not possible, you can consider really having kind of a physical barriers like uh, these plexiglasses 
or really uh, wearing some masks. That's up to you how you'd like to stay during these times. And it depends how this time is going on in the future with the pandemic. We have the situations right now, this can change in a week, and it depends already on the country you're living in. Um, and this also linked to uh, the post-COVID. Yeah, we would be uh, also, we don't know what's coming, what will post-COVID mean. But what I can uh, tell you so far, we are currently working on a special reopening program, which will be split into three different uh, parts. And we will also have one part saying post-COVID procedures. And uh, as soon as we have this ready, we will also then uh, reach out to you and uh, give you some guidance around these post-COVID procedures. I think one of the most important things is besides really the sort of cleaning uh, of the rooms is to recreate the uh, confidence with your guests. I think that's very important that they have the feeling of everything in place. Um, then again, another question around uh, table gloss and napkins. Um, yeah, shall I really uh, do a need to uh, put them, uh, can I leave them for some hours? We would recommend really to put them uh, as short before the guests are coming on the table as possible, at, at least during this pandemic. Nevertheless, of course, the likelihood to get an infection with the napkins and the table loss is very low. This needs to be said in addition. But if you want to be 100% well, as safe as possible, just uh, yeah, put them on the table shortly before the guests are coming. Um, we have now, and I just mentioned it, uh, 2.30. Um, for me, Scott, do you still have time? Because we have many questions coming in. I would like to stay, if it's okay for you, a couple of more minutes. Yeah, yeah I can stay another 10 minutes or so, yeah. Okay, so then let's go on. Uh, is a 500 ppm chlorine solution recommended, Scott? What do you say? So, um, my understanding was that um, I think it was the European CDC have recommended 1,000 ppm of chlorine. Um, these situations, they, they, you know, this is, the recommendations are changing on a daily basis, but my last understanding was it was 1,000 ppm that they recommended. Oh. Um, if you've got an authority in your country here who say 500 ppm is okay, then 500 ppm would be safe to use as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, then one question was around carpets and sofas. At the moment, we do not have any valid data on how long uh, the survival time of the virus is on the different uh, carpets and sofas. I know that there are some steaming procedures in place that might help the best thing, however, is really to uh, just leave uh, the room closed for a couple of time. Um, yeah, that's... I think that's something we need to uh, find out later if which procedures will really kill this on uh, different uh, carpets and sofas. So do you have any idea around this, Scott? Yeah, I, I would have said the same. Um, they're going to be difficult to, to do any, any wet cleaning on. Um, even if you were to spray something on the surface, being sure to get through the whole fiber is, is, is quite difficult. So I would say the drying option is, is the, the best one. So. Letting it, letting it dry out and the virus um, inactivation coming from the, the lack of moisture would be the way to do it. Yeah. One of the topics, and it's coming again and again, is really the availability of eClub products. And uh, as our competitors, uh, we have a challenge around the products. We are clearly open around this topic. Uh, the demand is really a lot of higher than usually. We have now, we are working really in endless shifts. We have reopened more uh, factories, uh, more plants to produce more products, especially disinfectants. So it's a step-by-step -step process. Uh, but I completely know that it's not as good as it should be. That's why we usually also recommend clean more often. With cleaning, you can already reduce the risk tremendously. So don't forget to clean properly. Um, then another one. Uh, do I need to, shoe, to sanitize the shoe soles? There is at the moment no guideline that says uh, you need really to disinfect the shoes. It might be in a site, but I have seen no recommendation that means you need to sanitize the shoes. Um, what about the guest baggage? Um, at the moment, it's the same as with the uh, transportation of uh, different uh, other stuff uh, that we said before. There is no need to disinfect the guest baggage, just 
have in mind the proper hand sanitation. That's the most important hand washing and disinfectants, the most important. Then how to deal with uh, waste? Uh, very good question. And it depends uh, on your institution. Because if you have, if you're a care home or some or a hospital, you anyhow have special procedures in place. If you're a normal uh, a hotel or whatever, you just put them in a bag, close it properly, uh, have a look that no sharp uh, uh, substances are in the bag, and then you're uh, okay. So that's the only thing you need to keep in mind. No different thing than you do anyhow. Just close the bag afterwards and uh, wear your, uh, and wash your hand properly. And also recommend it to wear proper gloves. Um, then, yes, uh, I've heard uh, system with ozone to sanitize, sanitize hotel rooms. No chemicals required. Scott, do you want to say something on ozone for sanitizing hotel rooms? Yeah, so, so ozone is actually a very powerful disinfectant. Um, but the way it's used is, is very critical. Um, ozone will react with, with any, any dirt in the area. So it's, um, it's something that's, that's typically used under very clean, in, in very clean environments to get this, this extra level of, of high level disinfection. Um, if we talk about um, disinfecting something like a, a room, yes, there's, there's different techniques where you can use fogging, uh, or, or nebulizing effects to, to spray um, a mist or a fog of whatever, in this case, it would be an ozone gas that they're putting in. There's other ones you can do it with hydrogen peroxide, et cetera. Um, and you can spread that into a room and, and that should eliminate any um, virus or bacteria that are still on exposed surfaces. Um, it's a, it's a system that, that, that can work. It's, it's very difficult to do, um, to do it properly and safely. Um, and you have to remember that it's a one-off. So there's no resi residual effect. So it will give you a one-off cleaning or one-off, sorry, cleaning is wrong word, one-off disinfection of your room. But afterwards, as soon as somebody goes back in there, you're back in the same situation you'd be in normally with the risk of, of contamination. So yeah. it's something that can be done for recovery situations. If you had a, a really bad outbreak, you might want to do this, but for routine work, it's not suitable. Great. The next one is disinfecting tunnels for human by spraying on them. I would not recommend really spraying on uh, some humans. You need always to be careful with the different disinfectants. I've also heard about uh, this kind of procedures. Um, normally, it will not help you from getting the infections because you have them inside yourself. In the mucosa, when you cough, anyhow, you can get it disinfected. So I would really rather recommend to have a proper hand hygiene. Um, there are rumors around the that the virus spread by shoe sole. Is this true? I've not heard any kind of things around uh, viruses spreading by sh shoe sole. So I know there are so many rumors around, but you need to really take and absorb these uh, viruses via your soul in your mouth. So as, as soon as you do not take them, the shoe into your mouth, no, I would not uh, disinfect my shoes. Um, how long can coronavirus be on textile? Yeah, we still wait for this uh, kind of studies. Uh, I just uh, was reading the first studies to you. Uh, that's why we cannot give you a, a final information on this. Uh, but in general, we can say, uh, as long as it's dry, it will not survive that long. That's what we know. So uh, the virus does not like dry uh, environments. So that's really helpful at this time. Um, again, something around the ecolab range. We have so many products in place. That's why we cannot recommend here something for you. It's something you need to ask your really local uh, ecolab colleague and they will be able to help you. Um, yeah. What around the cutleries on Buffett? Uh, that's what they said before. Please clean it as often as properly. Um, yeah, we already mentioned around uh, what about the fans and what around the air conditions. I think that's what we already answered so far. Um, yeah, what around beds in hotels? That's also a fair point. At the moment, there is no study saying that you can get COVID-19 via an animal. So that's the latest status. Uh, no studies in place that you can get via an animal COVID-19. 
What about ice cubes? Uh, the same there at the moment, there is uh, no studies in place saying they can get uh, by really uh, absorbing uh, water, uh, by eating or uh, drinking water or ice cubes uh, that you can get uh, COVID-19 or the same there, clean and sanitize more often as you do anyhow. Um, and we're almost through it. So uh, how soon do you think you will have the reopening procedures information? So we. It depends on the country. We are working really hard on it. So it's a step-by-step -step process. Uh, give us, uh, yeah, let's say two, three more weeks, and then we will reach out to you. And if it's urgent, mail me, and we can get in contact soon to help you for your personal needs. Um, you already answered, Scott, around steaming the guest rooms. I think that's totally fine. Um, and also the garbage, uh, that's also something that I just answered. That you really keep them in a in a bag. Um, are there more presentable gloves for the reception? And that's the question around gloves. If you work on the reception, Scott, please correct me if I'm wrong. There is no need to wear gloves. Really, just have in mind something for proper hand hygiene. That's the most important because wearing gloves gives you this kind of wrong security that Scott already mentioned. So if you work in a reception, it's more important to really have a proper hand hygiene in place. And I would probably think about having some kind of plexiglass uh, in front to really uh, decrease the uh, risk instead of wearing gloves. Anything to add from your side, Scott, on this topic? No, exactly the two points I, I would have made. Um, working at a reception, you're, you're not going to be touching as many surfaces which, um, which members of the public could have touched um, shortly beforehand. You're, you're in your limited space. So it's not as critical. You're not physically greeting people by hand. Um, but yes, this, this Perspex um, protection is the one that I would think is the, the most helpful for people working on a reception desk. Great. And I think we are now through most of the questions. Uh, if you have forgotten one of the questions that's really burning, uh, please feel free to write me an email and we will come out to you afterwards. Uh, and then, as we have now yeah, <laughs> a lot over the time, would like to thank you again for your attention. It was uh, really very fun. I really would like to thank you that you are so actively participating. That's always good for us. And yeah, there's only one thing to say from my side, stay healthy. And the last word goes to Scott. Yeah, again, as Victoria said, thanks everyone for your attention and stay safe. Bye bye.